thank y'all so much for coming out to uh, City Council District 3. Now, I know a couple of you were saying, hold up, this is not District 3, but it is now. We are so excited to have Woodland Park and all of the VA <laughs> neighborhoods in District 3. So thank you, thank you for coming out. It's so important for us to, to, to get together, to really put, to, put out there what our vision for our neighborhoods and what we're doing here on City Council together and communicate that to y'all. So that's what tonight is about. Thank you to the mayor for putting these together in each district. Look around to our staff. I want everybody to give a little clap to our staff for everything, everything they do for us, from our public safety professionals, water, Columbia Water folks, planning, code, everybody's here tonight. Um, and we have some elected officials here tonight as well, and I'll let uh, the mayor uh, uh, talk about them. Okay, and absolutely. And Council, County Councilwoman Shaquise Newton is here tonight. Say hello to Sh Councilwoman Newton. And State Representative Heather Bauer is here tonight. So, so fantastic. For those of you all that I may not know, I'm Oddity Bustles. I'm one of the at-large council members on council uh, with my colleague, Councilman Duvall. Uh, we are very excited to be here today. Uh, Mayor Rickman has put together a series of town halls to provide an update on the various projects and things that we've been working on. One of the things I love about the mayor is that he is someone who really wants to work together and what you're going to see is that these projects are very much a result of council working together, bringing together our different perspectives in order to find the best solutions for the different ideas and problems that we're trying to achieve. And you know, despite our disagreements at times, I think one thing that we all have in common is we really want to see Columbia be the best place to live, work, and play. And I think that energy that the mayor brings <laughs> about how excited he is about Columbia is very much contagious. So um, Councilman Duvall, would you like to say anything? Glad to be out in District 3, uh, new District 3 out here. I, I told John that I, I thought I was at home when I made the turn onto the road because I usually come out here for the National Night Out because uh, they have a great National Night Out in, in the, this area out here. So delighted to be back with them. Yeah, you have a full house today. So with that, I will pass it over to Mayor Rickman to start our town hall. Uh, well, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We're trying something different. Well, instead of having a state of the city, we decided to go to each district and have a town hall and have some discussion and kind of fill you in. There's so much. If you've been watching the screen while you've been sitting here, we there, there are about 150 different things that are happening in the city, uh, all to improve the quality of life here in the community for everybody, and we're so excited about it. But part of this is about engaging and hearing more. Some of you submitted questions. Some of you may sub submit some questions uh, afterwards that we'll get back to you. And uh, obviously, I'll hang around after it to have discussion. We'll be here just for the next three hours. So just sit back and relax. <laughs> no worries. Um, this is a lot of information, y'all. I'm going to be honest with you. But it's, it's, it's very important. And it's very exciting for us to, to be here and talk about it because I, I do. I wake up every day. I, I feel very blessed to have this position, and I realize how much our community has to offer. And one of the things I love is telling our story, something we haven't done a whole lot of. If it's recruiting businesses, it's recruiting officers, if it's out trying to figure out how we can take what other people have done and bring it to our community so that we can have some of those great attributes that some other communities have, and take great ideas. As somebody told me a long time ago, the best ideas are stolen, not borrowed. So um, we'll keep that trend going across. But I also want to know that we're here together. And I think Dr. Odyssey said it best. We are a working uh, council who's really tried to put together the best foot forward to about the quality of life. If that's investing in our city in every aspect, from our employees into technology, into training, making sure that we're doing everything we can to provide service to you all, our customers, because that's who you are. Are we where we want to be yet? No, we're not. But we're getting there, and every day we're improving, and we see improvement all the way across the board. Uh, I did want to take, I know Mr. Brennan had asked y'all to give a clap, but I would love all of our senior staff and staff that are here to stand up just so folks can recognize you and just take a minute to thank y'all again for supporting everything that we're doing. And I say that because we have everybody here from David Hatcher with Code Enforcement, Krista Hampton from our development uh, department, 
Shanique Belton from uh, our chief of staff, our South Region Captain, Captain P.J. Benlowski, our, our uh, <laughs> chief, where is our chief? He's somewhere in here. Oh, he's on the phone. He's working. See, he's working for y'all all the time. <laughs> Obviously, our city manager, Teresa Wilson, Pam Benjamin, assistant city manager, Clint Sheely, our assistant city manager who is over utilities. So all those phone calls you're calling me about water, there he is, right there. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm glad to see you all all here. We, Jenkins back there. Don't forget the chief. Uh, uh, the chief snuck in the back there. Chief Henry. Jenkins, and our Henry fire Simmons. chief. And where, Henry, there's Henry back there. Henry is head of our parks and recs. Uh, who's doing an incredible job. Uh, so we're excited to have everybody here in support. But we're probably going to start this evening talking a little bit about citywide uh, initiatives, kind of break it down, and then go straight into uh, our districts. Um, but I will, will tell you that we, we, we followed through with what M Mayor Benjamin started, which is we are one Columbia. We believe that. We're one Columbia, and we're only as strong as all of our pieces. And, and we want you all to be part of that. We want you to be part of the puzzle, and you all have a role in that. We'll get into that a little bit later. But every business, every public service, neighborhood, district, law enforcement, firefighter, government official, school, church, citizen are part of our city. We can't talk about one without the other. It, we are all part of the United team to achieve progress and success for our city. It's our job at the city to lay out the groundwork, and we got together as a council and made some strategic decisions, and those decisions were really about investing in the city. And we say that a lot because we really mean it. We've really invested in our employees, invested in technology, into our parks, and continue. And looking at innovative ways that we can do things differently. Um, being at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, I understand more and more that partnerships are important, collaboration is important. We cannot do the things that we need to do to improve the quality of life here without thinking differently and talking about how we work with the federal government, how we find the right partners to help us go after the grants. All the money in Washington is not formula-based. It is majority grant-based. So thinking strategically, how do we go after that? And how do we leverage it here at home? But bringing everybody together in partnerships, if it's relocating railroad tracks, if it's looking to the future, uh, working with Richland County on a, a possible new penny sales tax, focused on roads, in my opinion. And I know there's a lot of discussion to be had, but in a, in a community where 72% of the roads are owned by the state and we're not getting funding for it, we got to be creative. How do we create other ways to take care of the most important means? The number one complaint we get, roads. And 72%, so 492 miles in the city of Columbia are owned by the state. So working together through different avenues to focus on what's important. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but just so you have an idea, we could redo every road in the next 10 years if we had that funding source. Uh, and it's something to think about. But we're not there yet, but it's, it's part of it. But we need to bring it together. Continuing to do work on our existing infrastructure, new services, new approaches, when we started uh, the first February, we were in office, we were about 6,800 work orders behind. We've dwindled that down to way under 3,000. And part of that is, is talking with our staff. We learned that our own procedures were getting in our ways from getting things completed. We also realized that we needed to hire third party partners, small businesses in our community to help us. Let us do what we do best and you help us fix those gaps where we're losing. And that's working with those small businesses, which is a win-win for us. Because if we're working with small businesses, that means they're growing here, they're investing here, and guess what? They're giving back here. And I think that's so important. We continue to work on community-led initiatives off the ground. So many, a lot of suggestions that we're getting are from dialogue. People coming and sitting down and having conversations, making suggestions pointing out things that they may have seen in another community and say, why not Columbia? And I agree with that, why not? We should be the number one city in South Carolina and that's where we're headed and we're gonna continue to do that. But we can't do everything and nor should we. And I think part of that is, is why we're continuing to create these opportunities where we're taking the lead, but partnering. If it's homelessness, uh, if it's violence prevention, uh, if it's working with other agencies to attract businesses, 
So one of the things you'll see is that we're meeting, mayors are meeting on a quarterly basis with each other to have dialogue, how do we support each other? You know, Scout wouldn't be here if the state and the county and the city all didn't work together. It took all three of us to make that kind of investment happen. But for us to attract more people, we shouldn't be territorial. It shouldn't matter if they go to Lexington, if they go to Blythewood, if they go to Lower Richland, or they go to West Columbia or Columbia. We're all going to benefit because people are going to move. They're going to come visit our restaurants. They're going to come see our retail. They're going to do business downtown. They may live in our neighborhood. They may live in another neighborhood, but they're here in the Midlands. And I think that's an advantage because collaboration is, was one of our negatives as a community, and now that's changed because people are working together. Um, you know, we'll talk about things today like Finley Park, the Vista Greenway, Riverfront Pro, uh, Public Access. Finishing some of those outstanding projects we talked about, but also things like marketing, how we're taking our message and showing people who Columbia is and why they should move their business here. Collaborations with the University of South Carolina, Benedict and Allen and Columbia College and CIU and Lenore Ryan because all of their graduates and their alumni have key positions in multinational businesses. We should be using that connection that they have to get them to bring pieces of their business here. If it's back office, if it's cybersecurity, is it a subsidiary company? Is it somebody that's tied in? How do we attract those folks? And part of that is us going to them and telling them we want you in Columbia, South Carolina. We want you to be part of that in this community and we want you to invest here. So we'll be continuing to do that. Obviously, we're gonna give you a snapshot. I hope you picked up one of the pamphlets up there. There's a lot of information in there um, about the investment that we had and the things that we're doing. But at the end of the day, we're looking at the city's work and we see everything being part of the puzzle. And so let's talk about public service, services and essential functions. City of Columbia departments are consistently at work to make sure we have a safe, clean, enjoyable, and accessible city. Why is that important? Because those are quality of life. Number one reason why people are looking to relocate or be part of a community or stay in a community is they want it to have a great quality of life. They want to have entertainment. They want to have safe roads and streets. They want infrastructure that's sure. And I think we are doing that every day to make sure that we have the best community. You know, public services extend the high. Everybody thinks we just do water, but we do so much more. 911, streets, billing, animal services, municipal courts, planning and zoning, community development, parking, economic development, small business opportunity. I mean, the list goes on. There's 17 different departments doing things to improve the quality of life for our residents and our businesses. And you gotta do both, because you can't have one without the other. We also ma maintain the largest municipal water system in the state, and we've had so many advances here. You know, we've, obviously we've changed all our meters, 150,000 meters across to the digital. Part of that is really so that we can monitor the use much better, but also we can respond to people and give them alerts when there are leaks and other things. Are they all perfect? No. Look, we're still human, there's still factors in there, but we're continuing to improve. But everything we're doing is providing much better service and much more information to you, our customer. We decreased the wall time, uh, call times. We had like 1,500 calls a day. Sitting down with our call team, we said, hey, what do we do to improve this? Well, the answer came from our employees is, let's bring in our night and weekend folks to Monday through Friday where the majority of our calls are. Let's you utilize a call service for late night and weekends so that we can address when the majority of people are calling and we can focus on those emergency calls. We can get people in and out less and we're down to less than two minutes uh, on wait times. We, we were around 10 minutes at one point. People were getting very, very frustrated but listening to our employees and then taking action. And that's what working as a team has done with all of our, our city administration, council working together, all right, this is a priority, we wanna get it done, let's focus on it. We talked a lot about the work order backlogs, but that also flows into sewer, sewer overflows, the investment that we've made in our infrastructure to reduce sewer <laughs> overflows making sure 
that we're taking care of our environment around. And I have to throw in a plug. Y'all, we're the only city in the state of South Carolina who received gold status, lead gold status by the U.S. Building uh, Committee. And I think that's an incredible stature because there are only 16 cities across the whole country to get to that level, and we were that. And I was very proud to go to Washington to have that discussion and be on a panel because I think people were amazed that a small t city, per se, in, in, a, in, a, in what they presumed as rural South Carolina was so progressive, but it's about quality of life. If you look up the, the points and the markers in there, it's about the green space we have, it's about the tree canopy, it's the things that we're doing to reduce the fact that we did a heat study. We're 18 degrees higher than we should be. So the trees, the 500 trees that we're planting this year, looking at covering roads and all the roof whitenings and the things that we're trying to do to reduce that. Why is that beneficial? It's health, makes our community healthier. It also reduces our power needs. So for all of our residents, it helps all the way around. So one step at a time, we're getting there. Our goal is to be at platinum. I wanna be the first city in the Southeast to be platinum. I think we can do it, and I think we have the staff and the committees that are working together, our CPAC, Climate Protection Action Council, who's given us a pathway, how to get, achieve more and more, how we're getting more uh, renewable energy. But a large part of, of all of this is us working together and continuing, and I will keep on harping that this is a we tour. We do this together. The only way we're successful is that we all continue to work together. Will, did you want to add anything? I to tell that? you, infrastructure investment. You're, we're, we're sitting in District Three, where we are playing catch up with our our drinking, our wastewater, and our stormwater. So, uh, to my colleagues, thank you for the investment uh, in in the Rosewood projects and the Shandon stormwater projects and the many more that are, are in the pipeline. No pun intended. That was a terrible dad joke. I apologize. But. Uh, $28 million in drinking water for our Rosewood neighborhoods. There's still neighbors and residents, customers with brown water. We're getting rid of the Rosewood tea uh, <laughs> over time. We're doing that, we're invested. So three phase approach, we're about to put the fourth phase on the board to, to get a price on that design. So please support elected officials who support infrastructure, all right? That's, that's my, uh, my biggest uh, takeaway from this segment. Uh, it's important, it's very important. And also, to see where our customer service uh, platform has come in the three years I've been on council is amazing. And that is a commitment by Mayor Benjamin, Mayor Rickman, to really invest in people and the process. So making your interactions with your city, city departments, um, a pleasant experience is something that we aim to do, and I think we've made great strides in the past three years. Dr. Buffers, you want to add anything? No, I think you said it all. I'll, t I'll take her time. Okay. <laughs> I, I just have one thing to add. I want to go back to the water, uh, Columbia Water, and the mayor mentioned that we've put 150,000 AMI meters out. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, on the Columbia Water system, and if you haven't done so already, download the I Own Water app. That, that app will tell you if you have a leak, and it's the first thing we go to when I get a call from somebody saying, I've got a high bill, we can go into that thing and tell you for every 15 minutes how much water you've used. And, and some of the pros at the Columbia Water can even analyze, well, that's the signature of a toilet leak. They can tell that from the amount of water that's leaking. So use I own water, get it downloaded to your app. I will add with water, I think it's important to know that we are, you know, we're finally gotten through FERC and FEMA and we're in the process of getting to be able to start working on rebuilding our canal. But through that process, we also got granted money to build an alternative water source so that if we ever have a 2015 episode again, we don't have to worry about where our water source is coming from. We are gonna have a direct line into the Broad River, which is so important. That was a $42 million uh, boost for us as a community, but it also, which is great, it allows us to build another platform to connect more Greenway. So once again, it's kind of a win-win all the way around for the community. But a large part of our responsibility is around public safety, police, fire. Um, public safety is everything from our code enforcement um, to our Office of Violence Prevention, but public safety is also our investment in technology, cameras, lights, 
LEDs being changed, cleaning up sidewalks and cutting trees that are blocking lights and so forth to make sure that we have a safe pathway for everybody through our community. Um, this year, the Columbia Police Department released its gun violence assessment and action plan. And this information was the same that these national organizations bring to the table, except we did it in-house because we have the talent and the technology and the investment that we made internally. So we have all the data. And so that made for our office to, to have the Office of Violence uh, Prevention with Trayvon Forum to be a reality. For him to have the tools and the technology now to sit down, all right, we got the data set, all right, let's bring the partners together. So continuing to invest where we're playing quarterback not necessarily being the whole team or the whole source. And so we're so excited about those efforts that they're doing. Investing, uh, continuing into our officers, obviously, pay, having a step up program, upping our take home cars, trying different programs to recruit. Recruit is the number one issue that we have as a community, as most communities today, getting people to go back into law enforcement it's tough. Every time an officer steps out of that car, he's having or she's having to be absolutely perfect. And I'm going to tell you, having an opportunity to ride with some officers and seeing what they go through, I, I just I can't tell you how proud I am of our police department, our police chief, and and, and at that point, I really like y'all to give these guys and ladies a round of hand <laughs> for what they do. They really are working double time in a very hard position. And if you've seen some of the in interactions that they have to deal with and how they handle it with dignity and how they do it with compassion, uh, I have to tell you, seeing an officer deal with somebody in a domestic violence situation and focused on the kids first and foremost to make sure that they can deal and get them comfort and help them get through that as they sort out all that's going on at night with blue lights flashing and other things going on was amazing. And I, I can't be more prouder of our, our police department. I put them up against anybody. But the efforts continue to go in there as we continue to invest in there. We've talked about investment in their, in their salaries, technology, but also making sure they, they have mental health. These guys are, are stressed and put through more situations than anybody else. And you don't think about what they go through. You know, if they're having to witness the things that, that we all don't have to see and how that has effect on them and their downtime, but continuing to invest in there, the technology, making it easier. And I'm hoping that we can work with our representative. I know uh, Heather Bauer has been very supportive of everything we're trying to do, but we got to get red light cameras and speed cameras. We need that extra technology to help our officers um, and get rid of some of these n uh, unnecessary accidents in, in these intersections, slow down the traffic in school zones and work zones so that they can focus on the real crimes and not being tied up. Using that technology to our advantage, and for some reason it's, it's been a battle at the State House, but we're going to continue to fight to give them the tools. But that also means that we also have to use the tools for judicial reform, folks. We got to support our officers. The catch and release program's not working. We can't continue to arrest and release the same people that are coming back into our neighborhoods. I'm a big believer in its second chances, but fourth, fifth, sixth, and 41st is not an excuse. We got to change that, and that's working and supporting them with that is so important. We launched Operation Hope and Order this year, and Hope and Order really was working with our crisis team, our pathway units. These are clinicians that are embedded in our police department. Hiring private security also to help as we tackle a lot of the issues around the unsheltered and, and some of the petty crimes, false alarms and things so that we can make sure our officers are focused where they're best needed and let us work with our clinicians to make sure that we can get folks to the help they need and the wraparound services they need so that they're not in jail for 21 days to get back out and we start the whole cycle over. This is not helping those folks in need and we gotta have a little push there. 
but hope and order is really trying to take both sides, sticks and carrots, I hate to use that term, but the reality is, is coaxing people into a program, being able to touch them and instead of them being arrested or, or left out in, somewhere camping out, getting them into one of the programs that we've put together. Code enforcement, over 8,000 inspections, 20 demolitions. We got about 40 more demolitions to go. As we make those demolitions, we're going back and working with builders and mortgage companies to put home ownership back in our community. Very focused in uh, several pockets of our uh, city. We're starting in the Belmont neighborhood where we'll put uh, roughly about 12 homes in a pocket park in an area where we've had lots for over two decades and now trying to get home ownership and building that neighborhood back one, one house at a time. Working with, with code enforcement and others on a project at the University of South Carolina called the Ambassador Program. And part of that program is, is to work with the student population about parking, about making sure they're good neighbors and having an interaction so they have a one-on-one -on -one person to touch with, but they also understand how it's supposed to work, how you live in a neighborhood side by side. And knock on wood, I think so far, we, we've gotten a decent start. I, don't, I won't say everything's perfect, but we're gonna continue. And if that program works, then we want to expand that because we have more neighborhoods that are bounded by other colleges and universities. But having a pilot program to see how it works, it's a good way for us to have that interaction with all of our residents. Um, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just want to commend our, our, our staff and our willingness to, to get innovative and, and look for technology to help streamline our operations. When you leave here, you're going down Old Woodlands, you can look up and see the white camera with that big, beautiful blue light. <laughs> They're throughout the city, and it's that type of technology investment that we've made to really help out our team and, and streamline efforts. And I would just add that this council has been, I think, very vocal about ensuring that our uh, public safety teams have all the resources that they need, while at the same time developing solutions that are community-led and community-based, whether that's giving out free gun locks and helping people understand how to safely secure their firearms, or whether it's being the first city in the state to pass an ordinance that requires the reporting of a lost or stolen firearm, because we know that that's typically how people um, that are going to commit violent acts get access to guns. It's from someone's car. It's because it's stolen or, or someone forgot to that they had left something behind and you know it was taken out of their car. And so we are gonna continue to address violence in innovative ways, but I think we can't do it alone and it's gonna require the community, all of you, uh, the organizations that have been on the ground doing this work for a long time, to work alongside us. I think the Office of Gun Violent Crime Prevention is a great way to convene and learn from each other. And we'll continue to have open ears to understand the ways in which you all think that we should address <laughs> violence more effectively. Oh. I'd just like to second what the mayor said about, uh, I'm knocking on wood about how smooth the USC opening of South Campus has been. Uh, Lynn Shirley and the other two presidents from the, those neighborhoods have worked for over a year with the university knowing that this event would happen and I was a naysayer. I didn't think that the university could pull it off, but so far it seems to be working fairly well. Got a little work to do, however, but we're there. We're, there. <laughs> we're getting there and I think but part of that is is working together uh, collaboratively to address the issues and try new things. Look, we're gonna continue to try things. Not everything that we do is gonna work, but we're gonna be thinking outside the box. Uh, to try to achieve what we hear back in the feedback and a lot of what we're doing is feedback that's come to us from the community. Uh, I mentioned the Office of uh, Crime Prevention. Obviously, we have funded that and we're so excited about the initiatives that are working there, but we've done other collaboratives. We collaborated with Richland One. Richland One had a program called Jobs for America Graduates and it had it only at C.A. Uh, C. Johnson and it had about a 92% success rate. And what's great about this program is that it focuses on 50 to 60 kids that probably wouldn't make it to graduation. And they start in their freshman year and they follow that student all the way to their freshman year of college. They make sure that they're in school, that they're participating, they're getting the help that they need in tutoring and other. And what was interesting about this, the governor put out 
uh, uh, basically a challenge to the first 25 schools that would sign up, he would pay for 75% of the first three years of the program. So I called up Richland One, we went ahead as council and said, we'll pay for a part of it, Richland One's gonna pay for a part of it. We signed up every high school in Columbia. So now we have an opportunity, and it started this past January, where now every one of the high schools in Richland One has that program. What's great about it is that could be 500 to 600 kids that could be affected by this program, that have a chance to change their life and their direction of their life to improve. It's just one step of working closer in a collaborative effort to improve the quality of life. Is it the only answer? Absolutely not. But if those are five or 600 kids that don't get in trouble, that's five or 600 kids less that we're focused on violence prevention. Because we know people, places, and behavior are the three points of information we already know. We're focused on the preventative, the intervention, and I, unfortunately, at the end of the day, law enforcement plays a part of that role too. But we're focused on that. And so that encompasses everyone. That encompasses our schools, our churches, our community. This is a community issue. I think you'll hear our chief say it, you'll hear our sheriff say it, they're working in collaboration together on addressing it. But we've seen a projection in violence, both in domestic and gun violence. And we're gonna do everything we can. And there are folks who said we shouldn't get involved in this, but how can we not get involved? It affects our community. Mm -hmm. We have to be involved. We have to be part of that puzzle, but it takes all of us. But we'll continue to think of innovative ways and ways to, to continue to move that effort. Obviously, we could not survive without our fire department. Um, Chief, fire, thank you all for everything you do. As you know, this district seen it, uh, had it some, some issues in fire, and these guys were right here in a collaborative effort, even Fort Jackson working together here, especially when Hammond School was on fire. They came from everywhere and got it before it turned into a, a much larger disaster there is. But our fire department does more than just come and put out fires. They do inspections. They inspect every building, every hotel, every school. They work with communities to install smoke detectors, fire alarms, and they do that. I think they did over 250 this last year. They've inspected, obviously, every school. But we're investing in them, too. We invested in an uh, advanced program for pay so they know what they can make over a long injection in each position so they can chart their own course but made it competitive for them to stay here and compete on a salary level but also a quality of life because I do think we have one of the best fire departments. Investing along with the county on second bunker gear, making sure that they have all the safety and tools that they need. But our next step is new firehouse, uh, having a new fire station over uh, by the Olympia area where we have a gap and we're working on moving the train, but that's not gonna happen overnight, so we gotta make sure that we get folks the safety and they, they're protected equally. Continue to invest in each one of those houses with cleanup rooms, looking at how we go back to our firehouses, improve the sleeping conditions, the quality of life that they have inside, but continue to go after that with equipment. Working with the county to ensure that we have the right funding needed to keep are our firefighters safe and our citizens safe? But these guys are the first ones who go to a wreck, making sure that they have the tools and the, the technology to be the first responder that they are. You know, I would prefer them not going to every wreck and that we ha have long-term that EMS and fire are in one place so they can dispatch out of there. But right now, we're working in tandem. And to make sure that somebody's there when those accidents happen, that's why we have to go with the first responders, but they're there. We just had fire prevention week here in this room this weekend uh, with a big parade through this neighborhood and this district with lots of kids here, firefighters here, talking about how important fire prevention is. And you know, it's so important that we continue to teach people because a lot of the fires are, are accidents. And what we don't want is more accidents. We want less accidents. We want to continue to have a safe in, in a community. <clears throat> our homeless initiative. We have focused on homelessness this year, working with our unsheltered. 
and really trying <coughs> to address the issue because it's growing and it's having some adverse effects on our community. It's not healthy for our homeless, our unsheltered. It's not healthy for our residents. And it's not healthy for our businesses. So we, we decided to do the pallet home, the rapid shelter. We put 50 pallet homes up. And we did that because we wanted a place that we could start getting folks into an individual situation where we then could get wraparound services to them. So we could help them then get to more permanent housing with wraparound services. None of it works if the wraparound services aren't there. And what we've been doing is just simply not working anymore. We've been doing the same thing for 20 years, and I will tell you they're more unsheltered right now than we've ever seen before. They're in every corner of our community. They are not and just in downtown. They're on 77. They're on Harbison. They are at Forest Drive. They are in every corner of our community. And we've got to get those folks into getting help. And to just long, for, long term, we want to build a, a Hope Center. And a Hope Center is a single location that provides all the service. We've been working hand in hand with DMH, with the governor's office to, to start to formulate an off, off uh, concept that we could then bring together with all the partners in it. So think about a center where you had urgent care, you have physical therapy, you have behavioral therapy, you have the mental health services, you have classes, you have dining, you have pantry, but you also have dentistry. You have DMH and DMV and DHEC all having a, a participatory role in that because right now, when an individual has to go get their license or ID, which is the key to getting all of your benefits, it takes one volunteer on those four hours to take one person to do that. Imagine what we could do if we had everything in one location and you were doing it on a couple of days. You could get people their services and find out where their benefits are and what they qualify. And if they don't figure out how we get them qualified all in one place, along with housing. We need housing in four categories, folks. We need, we need temporary housing, which we call rapid. We need transitional, and I'm, when I use the word transitional, I'm using it loosely, that folks that are waiting to get from a, from a voucher that they qualify into housing, because sometimes it takes longer to get a unit for those individuals. We need mental health. 37% of our unsheltered in our community is mental health. Probably an equal amount or maybe greater is addiction. So then the fourth piece to that is having addiction, working with Laredac, working with DMH to help handle that. And each one of those housing components has to have different elements to it, depending on what we're having. If somebody is in mental health, they have to have different colors. They can't have metal. They have to have wood. All of these things that we've learned from these other communities that are doing these type of projects, if it's in Gainesville or Houston or, or other cities that are working, but getting people into individual units <coughs> allows us to get the one-on-one -on -one and get them the help they need. Um, you know, there's probably 10% of that population that we may never be able to help because they just are, are going to choose not to do it, but it's not going to be because of a lack of us trying to address that issue. We spend right now $40 million on homelessness as a community. 103 different providers. We gotta bring folks together and collaborate. We gotta do more at, with milestones and objections and ways to hold us accountable. We need to make sure we're making a difference and we're not just enabling homelessness. And I think it's great that people wanna feed and provide and do all that, but if it's not helping someone, get out of it, then we're just enabling it. And that's not solving a problem either. That's just extending that problem. But we've had some great success with the rapid shelter. It's for what we've gotten over 30 people from there into, I think uh, the new number yet the other day was 32, when it's Ms. Manager, 32. So we're excited about making that difference. We are making a difference because th this doesn't happen overnight. It's usually 90 to 120 days to get that individual into the next level. We're gonna continue to work together as a community. Dr. Oddity uh, Bustles was our, our homeless task force, so I'd love for you to, to add to that. And then well, we'll, Councilman Brennan and I, um, we worked together on that committee and it was really important <laughs> for us to understand the root causes of homelessness 
And before we did that, I think it was also especially important for us to define what homelessness meant in the context of what the city can make a difference, right? When you think about homelessness, there are so many different factors that play into that, and the city can't do it all, but we can certainly do our part. And so through that process of meeting with providers, meeting with business owners, meeting with experts in, on housing and the judicial system, we identified several different potential root causes that we then attempted to address through our rapid shelter, um, you know, looking at ways in which we can improve our outreach. So one example is, there are, while there are 103 providers that are doing some sort of work in this, with this population, no services exist after 5 p.m. And I'm sure you can guess that we typically get calls for service at 5 p.m. when people are interacting with maybe someone having a mental health crisis or an addiction crisis you know, on Main Street or in the Vista. And so these were the hard conversations that I think we had to have to help people realize that it's not any one person's fault. It's that we're continuing to do things kind of status quo and in silos, and it's not making as big of a difference <coughs> as it can. So Councilman Brennan and I have been looking at ways in which we can change how our services within the city are funded. We're looking at uh, additional federal grants or opportunities that are coming down the pipeline to help support some of the work that we're doing. And I think we've both been very, very vocal about the fact that we have to have accountability and outcome measures built into our overarching plan. People have to work together and not just take their little piece of the pie and their you know, subpopulation of those that are unsheltered and continue to work without really realizing that everybody has to make things happen together in order to make a difference. Absolutely, absolutely. I hope, I hope everybody can see we're trying. And, and truly, we are invested in this process. We are going down a road where we wanna, we wanna uh, put the blueprint together to show the gaps of uh, homeless services, homeless funding, and go to the State Department of Mental Health, go to HUD and say this is, if we circle this up, this could, this could be the ultimate delivery of homeless services. So we're out here on an island. We are invested in trying to put that blueprint of passionate, compassionate services together for our unsheltered. So I think we've got some wonderful successes over the past year and a half that uh, the pallet shelter has been there, but we have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. This council is not scared to do that. That's what, that's what I'm thrilled about. <laughs> but we're also investing heavily on taking advantage of one of our greatest assets that we've kind of missed out on for a long time, our riverfront. And through partnerships and extensions with working with Dominion Energy, we now have 200 acres that we have access to so we can help expand. Going to work with uh, Irmo uh, Recreation Commission, the Mungo Foundation, and others. And long-term plan, you'll be able to go from downtown on a bike or walk and go all the way to the dam and back. And then you come back and you spend a little time at the zoo, you can cross over Elmwood into Elmwood Park and ride over to Bull Street and catch a game. And then you can take your bike or walk back downtown <coughs> and never get in a car. Connecting those, those pieces, finishing that greenway, taking advantage of partnerships and opportunities to work with the River Alliance and other folks to put those pieces together. The investment that Irmo um, Recreation Commission is doing, the Mungos, what they have invested to get us that uh, 20 to the dam piece, opening that up, met with the Jordan family who now has some property both on the uh, Broad River and on the Saluda side, allowing us to connect in there, opening up more opportunities where we can take advantage for, of the tourism point, but the recreational point and the asset. People want more green space, more access to the river, more points for you to put in a kayak, more places to raft. Maybe you just want to hang a hammock, hammock up down the trail and enjoy the sounds and the beautiful sights of the river because we have something a lot of communities don't have. We have class two rapids and we have Spanish moss. We have water lilies. We have heron otters. We have striper, trout, everything that, that people want to take advantage of, but we've, we've kept the river like a hidden secret for so long. And the investment by the Boyd Foundation with Boyd Island coming online, the two, actually I think they're up to three bridges now that they're supporting in our community. 
and then working with the Ginyard family to open up William Street, that 63 acres there, get, get the residential and the commercial piece lined up so that we know where the future taxes are coming from from there so that we know we have the funding source to support a riverfront park that becomes into the gateway of our community. Which I'll add is part of District 3. So I'm excited <laughs> about that. The second I feel like best I'm addition a lot of to time District 3 uh, and three. The, uh, the, the rebounding of, uh, of District 3. But, but excited about that because for 15 years we've been talking about it and it's actually happening. The William Street Extension uh, is underway. We're about 30% on the construction documents. So it's going to happen. So now the planning is going and the Ginyard family has become an incredible partner. Charlie Thompson, I have to give him um, just props. His idea and his vision of what it's going to be like, it's going to be what people are going to go, they're going to go, wow. They're going to see what we already know, but they're going to see it in a different light. And we're going to be able to actually use it for the benefit of our community as a whole. But it wouldn't happen if it wasn't about partnerships, sitting at the table, and working together. And I'm so excited about our continued efforts to collaborate with everyone. Obviously, Public Works Department, we've completed and launched so many initiatives across our infrastructure and to beautify our, our, our com community and neighborhoods. You know, everything from the, uh, the 500 trees that we're planting in the roadway, working on some beautification projects. We're not there yet because we still got a partner. As we mentioned, 72% of the roads are owned by DOT. So partnering. This summer we did a partnership, Richland County, City of Columbia, and DOT worked together to work on a couple gateways, how we can improve those gateways, making sure that those roads are repaired and clean, that there's not tomato plants growing up on UG Street as we have guests coming into our community, getting that dead grass out, repainting those medians and those the yellow lines and make sure that people know that we care about our community. But we can't do it all alone. So partnering with garden clubs and other folks and and getting going after grants, more grants to plant more trees, looking at different ways to plant trees. We're working on a project with Dominion uh, that another community did where they put these bamboo ga kind of gates over the top of the tree so the tree grows out instead of up so we don't have to butcher them every time we have the lines, which is, you know, something that, that we're working to improve. What can we do around? We can't underground everything. And in a hurricane-prone state, we have to have the balance because underground takes twice as long to repair. But we also don't want every tree to look like it, it's, it looks like an L shape <laughs> or a U shape. Working on that together, but continue to make an investment in the beautification and through partnerships because it does add to the quality of life. Making sure that, that we, we take advantage of Love Your Block programs that we put back in to allow communities to get grants for beautification if it's signs or plants. Working with our gateways, we are working with the Midlands Leadership Group. Dr. Bustles has been working on that program along with all of our surrounding counties. So all the gateways have beautiful ways of entrance. I mean, you think about it. You come in on 126. There's nothing welcoming you to Columbia. Uh, having a great welcome of that with nice plants and nice entrance ways on those interchanges as you come in, people see the pride. Coming in on 378 from the beach, coming to our community, clean, you know, making sure that they were investing, looking at, you know, what are the opportunities for us to use different types of vehicles to pick up trash and get it cleaned up. Uh, Sumter and Orangeburg are working on a program by taking a, a, a it's, a, it's like a vacuum truck, but it actually flows across the median and cleans up all that trash so that they can keep those, those entranceways clean. Working with our, our, our you know, we have the largest training base, 60% of all military trained here, 45,000 recruits, $6.7 billion, 255,000 family members come here to visit. We want to make sure those gateways are, are beautiful for when they come. But we are a city that's blessed with nine gateways. And we can say we're cursed with nine gateways as well to maintain. But they're all very important because we want growth in every one of those gateways. It shouldn't matter if it's North Main or Monticello 
We have to work with our partners to ensure those gateways all look the same. So wherever you come through our community, it's exactly the same. We talked a little bit about our LEAD and our GOALS certification, and, and I'm so excited that we have gotten that. Um, did anybody want to add anything to? It's, it's about pride in your community. You know, when, when, when you see litter, you can't unsee litter. And City Manager Teresa Wilson has heard me you know, go to bat to say, we need more money for litter pickup. You know, DOT doesn't give us any as much money as they should or service our roads as much as they should when it comes to litter and beautification. So it's, it's the approach of this council, we're gonna bootstrap it and go find the money. So uh, taking it on and really having pride in our, not just our gateways, but our, our major thoroughfares, our community roads, that's where we need to get creative, innovative, and continue to partner, like the mayor says, to really take pride in all our communities. And in addition to that, I think we're also willing to and have gone to the state and had some conversations about potentially increasing the fine for littering uh, to really incentivize good behavior and keep our community clean. And so continuing to find those partnerships on a local and state level as well to make some changes around beautification. Absolutely. Uh, we are not a dump ground. We are the capital city, and we need to look like the capital city. Mr. Duvall? Can I pitch one in? Yeah. I, I think you all can see the excitement the mayor has with this, this development and all the council has with this development. Uh, from William Street to the river to the repair of the canal to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, trail systems that will be connected uh, throughout the city of Columbia and in the Midlands. And I want to leave one challenge for the re returning council members. Uh, Harbison State Park has 18 miles of paved trails or, or prepared trails in Harbison. We are about four miles from Harbison on our rail system now. And sometime in the near future, I want us to connect to Harbison to put that 18 miles into Very our cool. bank of trails. I can see the Midlands of South Carolina becoming, uh, what you call it, an eco, eco, eco tourism. Eco tourism to come in here to, to run the trails. We can have marathons on the trails in the Midlands of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. Challenge. Challenge accepted. Challenge. Only if you start playing pickleball. <laughs> pickleball courts on every turn. Right. Yeah. Howard's our uh, pickleball champion, but we found out after all the get pushing and pushing that he doesn't even play yet. <laughs> so we're, we're thinking maybe that's what we need to get him a set, a pickleball set for uh, his <laughs> retirement so that he can pick up the game. <clears throat> but it is important because the, the, the tourism, especially around the river and others, is so important because we get 16 million visitors here, folks. 15.8 million visitors last year. That's a lot. That's a, that's a big number. Myrtle Beach only gets 22 million. The difference is, is that we're only getting about five and a half to a little under six million spending the night. So the more activities we have, the more at things that are going on here, concerts, cultural, uh, from our riverfront to our art festivals, the more investment, the more money we're getting back, people in hotel stays, spending that money in our restaurants and retail and drawing more people to our community. We're getting them, let's get them to spend the night and be more part of our community. Obviously, one of the big projects we're working on is the modernization of rail and folks, in 1905, there was a book written about the modernization of Columbia. And there are two things in there that we're working on right now. One is Finley Park because it called for a central park and obviously redoing Finley Park. And the other is moving the rail. So 120 something years later, we're moving forward, believe it or not. Uh, we've secured funding from the state. Um, we are applying for multiple grants through the federal government, working with our DOT partners, taking advantages of our relationships in Washington to really go after that. We, we didn't get the mega or the info of this round, but we had a debrief with DOT on those. And so we learned what we needed to improve in our application. So we were applying, we were encouraged to apply again. But we're meeting with the Build America Bureau and other folks to look at how we can be creative. Because if, if we are able to elevate Assembly Street and get rid of 15 other crossings. We're in a community that has 60 crossings in its city. 
what it does for safety, what it does for the ability for Assembly Street in those neighborhoods and on down. This goes all the way to Lower Richland. It opens up communities for growth, but also it keeps them from being disconnected because right now they are. Safety reasons, police, fire, how many times you've been caught by a train and you can't get through? Well, think about if your house was on the other side of that. That's why building that new fire station is so important. But elevating, the other reason is, is the automotive industry is benefiting our state. It's become a major economic play. But what done with that between the inlet port and our port system is increased rail traffic in our community by 47%. And the projection is to get much larger. And that's before Scout even comes online. So understanding how important it is for us to address this issue now before it increases. I'm very happy for our partners in the upstate and the low country for all the money they're getting, but all we're getting is the pass through. We're not getting any income off that. So we need to make sure we protect our community. Along with that, we are investing in the quiet zones. And this was a project that was brought to us and partnered by Senator Harpoolian. And we're hoping we can get it fully funded. And that means in changing the safety, increasing the safe crossings of our rail downtown. Why is that important? Because once we've done those enhancements for safety, that means bumping up, making sure that we have the blocking new gates and everything to keep people from crossing, then they'll quit blowing the horn when they go through town, which I think would be pretty nice for some of them because I do get a lot of those phone calls. Why are people blowing the horn in, at 5 a.m. and 2 a.m. and 11 p.m.? But if we can change some of that and also enhance the safety of the crossings in our community, once again, improving the quality of life. Did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to put a historical point in here. That uh, 1905 study that the mayor was talking about was done by the Olmstead group that did the Biltmore House in Asheville. And it also said that one of the things that the city of Columbia needed to do was take the bottom of those five streets that went downhill and make a large lake, hence five points. So they, they recommended that five points would make a great place for a lake, and as we have spent the millions and millions of dollars, they're probably right in 1905. Well, 120 years later, we're still learning. That's right. But we're getting there. Obviously, the next piece for us is our investment in neighborhoods and communities, the heart of our city, our parks and recs department, investing in there. Obviously, Finley Park, the crown jewel uh, with its investment. And I hear a lot of people say, well, what's going to be different about it? Oh, uh, a lot of things. Number one, we're actually going to have folks there park rangers, others being part of that. Our park, that park never had ownership. If you look at our parks and the healthy parks, they all have ownership. This park has ownership all the time. The parks that have ownership, and that's what you see in other cities, ownership, maintenance, having a crew there, making sure it's safe and lit, but the, the, being able to activate it, having the outdoor exercise, uh, ability there. The walking trails in a center of the city are very important, especially as we're continuing to grow with residential downtown. Having components for our, our children, new water features, keeping that iconic but adding more to it so it's enhanced. Using the right quality of plants so there are no pockets that everything feels safe and open. A new amphitheater that can be used from everything from Shakespeare to concerts reactivating that, bringing our communities together. And we're so excited about that crown jewel. And I think you're, you'll be excited about it uh, when we get it open here in the next 20 months. Uh, if we can push Mr. Simons maybe earlier. <laughs> We've invested in Hyatt Park and baseball. We had uh, Asia Wilson use her foundation and others to make get us uh, a redone uh, the basketball courts with art, but it, getting them and what's great about it is the story about what Asia did brought Nancy Lieberman to the table. Nancy Lieberman is the first female coach in the NBA. And Nancy has a foundation, and I met her at a meeting, and I started to tell her about the projects that Asia did and how great it was that Asia continues to give back to our community besides being the MVP of the playoffs and all the <laughs> great things that she does and an incredible role model. 
And Nancy sent me a letter and said, I want to do I want to build a second second one as part of my foundation. I want to bring it. Y'all figure out where we're going to do it. I want to do it. But she goes, I want to do it in a challenged neighborhood. Because when I was a kid, I had to travel to a public park to learn how to play basketball. And if I had not been there and learned how to play hardball, as she called it, then she would have never been on two national champions. She had never been in a, a women's NBA, and she would have never been the first female coach in the NBA. She goes, I, I can stay toe-to-toe -to -toe with every one of those guys, but it's because of what I learned in a public park, and that's what she's doing investing. But that's opening up more opportunities. We're applying for more grants. We're applying for four grants right now to do an outdoor exercise in every district. So a plaza that has built-in equipment so that we can do it. Part of that is our overall for a healthier community. We want to do the blue zones. We want to make sure that we're doing an assessment, a partnership with Richland um, Memorial to bring the blue zones. If you don't know what the blue zones is, it, it's targeted areas across the globe where people's life expectancy are getting closer to 100. We want to be that community. We want to do a community assessment and say, what can we do to improve the quality of life for all of our citizens? We've invested $100,000 in computers so that there's public use in our parks, access to Wi-Fi in our recreation centers, sports clinics to over 500 youth, over 1,400 kids this summer in summer camps. We took a library at one of our parks facilities that flooded and turned it into a neighborhood incubator so that startups have a place to go and start in their own neighborhood. So we're bringing things to the areas where we know their opportunity and there's incredible people there and we need to be partners with them and this is how we're partnering. Obviously, you know, we have programs on an average of 400 seniors per month with everything from bingo to special events to trips and a growing exercising uh, population and our seniors continuing to push, warning people to live longer, but our efforts got to continue to invest in our neighborhoods. Love our block grants, 12 neighborhoods that applied for that money, doing cleanups, 130 units and 20 units we repaired with community block grant. It's 130, 150 homes that we were able to use block grant money to improve. If it was weatherization, fixing roofs, redoing electrical, making a difference in people's lives so they can stay in their homes, leveraging those assets that we get from the feds, but working with our community partners to continue to make those investments. People like the Boyd family who are investing $7 million a year in our community for outdoor, Boyd Island, art, innovation center where they put a million dollars in for tech, looking to expand that, investing in our riverfront, paying for three bridges, which is probably six million in, in, in alone, continuing to make that investment for the betterment of our community. Obviously, food insecurity, big discussion. Been talking about it. We're so excited because now we've invested in one of the projects that came out of our food policy committee, which is a trailer, which will be working with Tom Creek's farm to bring fresh food and vegetables straight from the farm along with meats dairy products to neighborhoods, but we're not stopping there. We're gonna launch this month a, a project with Instacart using today's technology. 99% of our city can be delivered to, but getting free access to folks, both on Medicare and Medicaid, who have challenged to get to a grocery store. We've got a bank who's willing to work with us to make sure those folks can have bank accounts and the things they need to if they need to do it electronically. We've got a partner who's going to give Kindles for those folks who don't have electronic device so they can order. But the great thing about the Instacart program is Instacart's so excited about it, they want to roll it out nationally after they roll it out here. That's a Columbia, South Carolina project that's getting notoriety. We're solving a problem using technology is it gonna solve all of it? No, but can it help us get to the next level? Because building a grocery store and not being able to keep it open, it, it doesn't work today. We've tried it here. Spartanburg just went through their second time where they invested as a community $900,000 into a grocery store. It didn't make it 12 months. We can't afford for another grocery store to close 
because if it closes twice in an area, it'll never go back. So let's try something else. Let's build up. Let's continue to build up those neighborhoods, get the density and the ability to show them that that store can survive on its own and it will get support from the community. We're trying different things. Once again, a different part of it. Not only did we invest in our neighborhoods and our community, but we're empowering our city workforce, as we talked about. Salary market adjustments for all of our, our employees. Making sure that we have a step up play, as we talked about, plan for our fire and police. Leadership development and training. I had an opportunity to meet all of our hourly employees and I wanna do it again. I learned so much from them. I learned some of the things that we're doing that get in our way and not allowing us to provide great service, but also pointing out what they've learned from other communities around, what we could do to improve service. Listening, we're doing more listening. As, uh, as, as someone's grandmother used to say, you have two ears and one mouth, listen more, talk less. That's what we're trying to do, even though I'm talking a lot tonight. But I'm trying to fill you with all this information. Uh, obviously, our leadership development support, we got to invest in our employees and give them the tools to, to grow. We need to have the future administrator, the future mayors, the future ACMs, future police chiefs here, investing in new technology so we can communicate. We're working through with a group so that we can communicate better and more instantly and quicker to you with information that affects your neighborhood so we don't have to blast it to the whole city or wait on media, that we can send it to you block by block so that if something's going on, you know instantly and we can make sure we're taking that feedback that we get from you too instantly and tracking it. So when you call in the future and you want to know about that pothole or that water leak, somebody can tell you we're waiting on pups, we're waiting on this, and it's scheduled for this week, next week, two weeks from now, and that it's in the pipeline, that it hasn't got lost. Taking advantage of the technology that's out there to improve the city's efficiency. We're focusing on consolidating all of our offices, selling close to 17 properties across our city, putting them back on the tax roll. Why, what's great about that, A, it gives us an opportunity to use those properties for, uh, to get growth, more growth in our town, putting them back on the tax rolls, but it also gets our employees working closer together, departments within buildings with each other, making sure things are getting done, the communication, the collaboration. And then our third piece, obviously, is economic development. You know, we had an incredible last year. We did almost 600 million in development in Columbia. Our hospitality and business districts are growing. This month, we had more women-owned businesses open in our community than we've ever had. It's actually the predominant business that grew in this community. And that's incredible because that means we're doing the right thing. We're getting people to make investments. We've had over 900 new licenses just this year. We had over 1,300 over the last 12 months. That's new businesses, that's not renewables, that's new businesses, small and large, opening our community, taking part in it because they, they understand our community supports them. We're actively recruiting restaurants and retail. We're meeting with housing. We need 16,000 units of housing. We're meeting development teams that do good projects that maintain projects and that they know how to mix market rate and 30% median income in the same units growing downtown one block at a time, making sure that we have workforce and attainable, affordable housing is part of all of our needs. Embarking in the Imagine study, this is a study of partners with the Realtor Association to really examine what our future needs are. Greenville embarked on this, and it's interesting. Greenville's most needs in the future are townhomes, condos, and apartments. Quadruplexes, duplexes, not single-family homes. Why? 85% of the needs are really basic around baby boomers downsizing, single mothers with no kids at home, and millennials who are not interested in traditional home ownership, want smaller units, more compact. That's where the future higher density is what we're looking at. And so we're having to figure out how we integrate that in our community and using that study to make sure that we're addressing the 16,000 units we need. Obviously, we continue to see growth in Bull Street, more, more housing going there, more buildings going in. Slowly but surely, it's growing up. 
we, we see investment. We're going to have over $2 billion worth of investment going on in the next 18 months in our downtown through, through downtown living, through businesses building and relocating, Class A office. But we also have to look at what do we do with some of the old office. How do we take those and incentivize those to be workforce housing so we can keep our uh, keep employees downtown so that we make sure our workforce is here and they can afford to stay not like other communities where they're pushed out we want to make sure that we have our core community in every part of downtown and that's what our goal is um, obviously scout motors big deal that's four thousand jobs that's major investment why i think it's so incredible because when i called the mayor of chattanooga tennessee I said, how has VW been as a partner? He goes, they're involved in our schools, they're involved in our arts, they're involved in our restaurants. They, they, everything that they can do to invest in our community, they're doing it. They are part of our community. And he said, the best thing I learned about VW, and I've never forgotten this, he said, every plant that they built, they've never closed one. Never closed a plant. So when they come here, they're invested, they're part of our community, and that's good for all of us. Obviously, our Office of Business Opportunity and Economic Development are being supporting of the small and existing businesses in our, in our area. Um, we say we did 50 ribbon cuttings. We did really about 70. Uh, it's just been amazing. Uh, the businesses are growing, and it's a lot of it's incubated out of COVID, which is amazing for all the headaches that we dealt with, the pandemic. So many good things have come out of that, and it's also opened our eyes where we have gaps and what we need to fill and what we need to correct. We've hosted, we've helped, I think, over 5,000 small businesses through this. You know, we invested and, and worked individually with over 200 small businesses, making sure they understand what's available to them. If it's, it's grease trap credits, if it's the ability to get away with not having to pay for a sewer expansion fee so that they can turn an empty retail space into something that's, that's paying taxes and hiring people in our community. If it's working on how to navigate how to start up the business, get through the license, make sure they get the right permit so they have no delays because time is money. Um, and that's just a snapshot of all that's going on there along with all the recruitment trips that we're doing. But um, Will, you want to add to that? Let's keep it going. I'm feeling inspired. This is, this, is, <laughs> this is amazing. Now, you can really see the fruits of all this labor in five points with the small businesses, the, the hospitality districts. It's it's an exciting time to, uh, to, to be a, a, an entrepreneur in, in Columbia right now. We have gone out of our way to uh, get rid of the hurdles to starting a business here in Columbia. We have a new business liaison manager, Greg Williams. He is, he's very great at uh, putting out fires for that path to entrepreneurs to, to work with, with our city. So just, just very exciting stuff going on in, in the world of economic development. And you know, look forward to, to many more exciting projects uh, announced here in District 3 soon. So we talk a little bit about District 3. Um, just go through some of the, uh, as Will mentioned, uh, you know, the Rosewood area water system. You know, $35 million we're investing. Uh, the East Rocky Branch wastewater improvement, that's $24 million that we're doing. The Granby Park Canal improvements, 600. We're redoing Owens Field. You know, investing almost $1.5 million to improve youth soccer and the ability to have fields that are in great shape with irrigation, not a rocky thing where not only that, but our community that's involved in rugby and other sports can have these multi-purpose fields to really utilize what is an incredible park, but taking the time to do that, continuing to invest you know, in the tennis center and refurbishing there which is such a great asset. Continuing to invest in Melrose Park, it's pad and it's, it's a playground, the new splash pad that's coming. We got Mays Park getting a major overhaul. It's a, a, a park that has been there for so long, but now getting a whole new redone with pickleball, new tennis courts, new playground equipment. We're having more and more young families moving back downtown, so we need to make sure that we have those amenities, but a place that you can go and enjoy. We're gonna to continue to invest in every uh, park. Obviously, the Boyd Foundation, we talked about their investment, what they're doing with Boyd Island, the Boyd Innovation Center, uh, Hollywood, Rose Hill, Hampton, Grant, and Mel Melrose Heights. 
took Love Your Block grants. They used that money and invested and used it. Annual cleanups. We're continuing to, to support that with Clean the Midlands. Um, you know, we've had, if you look at all the businesses that opened up in District 3 from all good books, the Flying Biscuit um, is Sour and Salt, uh, and Sweet Gigi's moved down there. Uh, Ruby Sunshine's getting ready to open. We're meeting with actually a restaurant group tomorrow to show them three sites uh, in town. We've got folks from Charleston now looking at our empty storefronts and going, we want to be part of Columbia because Columbia has proven it supports small businesses, and, and, and that is a telling tale for people. Um, we're continuing, you know, with Burb, a Columbia student housing project. You know, we're still getting investment. State Credit Union expanding $27 million, 100 new jobs. So we're so excited about what's happening. Does anybody want to add anything to that? I just think that the energy is pretty palpable in terms of wanting to bring growth and improve the quality of life. I think District 3 is an amazing example of where that's happened and how we're continuing to build in that density, especially in Five Points and some of our other uh, entertainment districts within this district. And just looking forward to what's to come, I think. Um, Councilman Brennan and I serve on the Economic Development Committee with uh, Councilman Brown. and. We love all the projects that are coming our way. People want to invest here, and we hope that that continues. So we've covered a lot, and literally, folks, we can sit here for another an hour and a half if you want and talk about all the stuff, but we broke it down into multiple pieces. Uh, um, but when we talk about the, you know, three main pieces, economic development, public services, neighborhood, and community, that's where we're focused, but there's a fourth. So I want you all to look under your chairs. There's, there, there's a piece uh, on, on the a floor. Puzzle, uh, under your chair. I'd like you to pick it up. That's a puzzle piece, okay? So you're our fourth piece. So you're a part of the puzzle. And if you notice a puzzle, it fits in and creates a bigger picture. It also has multiple sides and it connects multiple ways. So I want you all to think about how are you going to be part of our piece of the puzzle? What are you going to do to help us make sure that we're getting to achieve what we want, which is to be the number one city in South Carolina that's focused on, on quality of life is number one across all neighborhoods, all corners. We're all part of the puzzle, and we're, we're embarking on that trade, and I hope that y'all will think about it. And I wish I could claim that I came up with this idea, but I actually uh, borrowed it from my pastor. <laughs> um, she put this on us, and it, what it, but it was incredible because what it did is made people start thinking about how I can be part of my community, how I can continue to be part of that. You know, we talk a lot about being open for business, but we're really open about ideas. We're open for critiques. I take criticism as a compliment, and I say that sincerely because if you didn't care, you wouldn't tell me. You would just post it on the Internet. And that would never help me fix something or help us fix something or our staff fixing. So when you call and somebody goes, well, I hate to complain, you're not complaining, you're actually helping us. Because if we don't know about it, we can't fix it. So be part of the puzzle. Think about how you're gonna be part of the puzzle and know that we're open to share ideas. We had some questions I wanted to answer them before um, everybody runs off to dinner. Um, Nancy, I have some questions from you. Um, you wanted to talk about the panhandling, especially at 77. And um, as you know, we continue to try to address the issue uh, the best we can. Um, 77 was a challenge for us for a while with all the encampment. Um, SCDOT did now uh, sign along for our police department, so they have the ability to go and remove people from trespassing in that area. We didn't have that ability before. Um, a lot of the panhandling that you see, and I just want you to know that, are folks that are coming and going out of our community. Most of them aren't homeless. Um, and we know that because our, our new district manager at the Garner's Ferry, not the Garner's Ferry, excuse me, the Forest Drive, Walmart tried to hire all these folks. Literally went and stopped and tried to hire everyone. And he offered them $16.50 an hour to start, and they told him he, they make $220 a day, seven days a week, tax-free. They were good. Um, 
we're trying to change that. We're doing the best we can, but we're very limited because some of it has to be aggressive, and they're not being aggressive, and there are others. But we are doing things to address it, especially by using shopping carts and other things that they may take from the area to use as a way to get them to stop doing that. But aggressive pan if somebody's aggressively panhandling, you need to call 911. If they're panhandling, let us know. Uh, we can move them along, but they're probably going to come back after we leave. We're trying to do the best that we can, but it is, uh, it's not a great reflection in our community. And uh, we know the majority of those folks aren't, aren't really in the situation that a lot of our other unsheltered are. Um, the Woodlands Park mural sign, I think you saw, it's actually being, I saw Saturday when I was here, they actually got the footing poured, so it's coming. Uh, long time coming. It was a vendor problem uh, to you, for you to know, but it's coming. Um, and I'll have to get back to you on where we are with the renovations here because I don't know where they are unless, Henry, do you know off the top of your head? So it's coming in our next fiscal year as a master plan. So we'll get some details and share that with you so you can share with the neighborhood. Um, what's the status and fate of bike lanes funded by the penny sales tax? Um, we're trying to put the ones in we can. Um, there's a lot of questions around a lot of, of the leftover money. So I think having that conversation with our colleagues at the penny sales tax, uh, all right, what's left over? What can we go ahead and do? We're looking at incorporating where we can bike lanes uh, as part of our, our future projects and coordinating that with DOT. We have Calhoun Street and a couple other streets being done. Our biggest focus really is to get the, the trails finished so that we can get a lot of those folks off the main roads and really safely traveling across our community without having to deal with traffic. Um, but we'll, uh, Carl, I will get information to you on that. I don't have the full status, but I will get it for you. Um, Harrison um, made the comment um, about recent speeches by folks from outside our city um, regarding our homeless population and kind of telling us what we can do and can't do in our own community. And um, wanted, we need y'all to join us in that discussion, folks. We are getting pushback from a lot of folks on trying to change things. We wanted to centralize feeding so that we could make sure that people who are providing a meal are providing it in a place that has AC, bathrooms, a kitchen, tables. I mean, I think trying to do something in a dignity way, but the pushback has been incredible from organizations. But we're getting every week at council folks coming from Atlanta, Gastonia, Greenville, Myrtle Beach, Atlanta, telling us what we should be doing and that we shouldn't prevent people. We're not preventing anybody from helping. We're trying to make it work where it's better and it's not such, it becomes less, it's not safe or healthy for people to continue to be provided meals and other things where they are and not getting help and not getting out of it. We're enabling that and that is not a good thing. And um, And we appreciate it because it's a, it's a very hard subject and we all want to do the right thing, but we also can't just allow things to just people to do whatever they want to do. The world's built with law and order, hope and order, and for us to be able to get people into the help we need, there has to be some guidelines around it. And we got to work together and I appreciate y'all pointing that out because uh, we've been taking it pretty, pretty good. Um, once again, I think I know that we, we're, we, we've talked a little bit about uh, dealing with the panhandling. Um, beautification, uh, there is no current funding for the beautification as we talked about, but that's where we're trying to partner with Richland County and also working with uh, DOT to work on these gateways. And I will mention, you know, there's a lot of discussion around the future of the penny. Obviously, the penny has brought in more money than everybody expected and talking about do you extend it and and this is something food for thought that we all need to think about we have to fund the transportation system some way so whatever we do we have to make sure 
that folks who need public transportation have it and it's steadily funded. But I will tell you that for me personally, and I'm not speaking, I'll let everybody kind of make their own comment on it, I would be in favor of extending the penny sales tax if we did it in this way that a third went to the transit system so that we know it's funded and that it can expand and it can be thinking in the future how we continue to grow that in a more effective and efficient manner. And that the city and the county each get a third for roads and sidewalks only. No specific projects, no university projects, no individual projects, strictly to do it. And I'll tell you why, we've sat down with our staff and we know that if we had the funding source like that, we could fix every road in Columbia in a 10-year span. But that also gives us money to help deal with some of the shortcomings that we may have with the state. So when we talk about beautification in our gateways, we talk about extra cleanup, making sure that, that state roads and the city roads all look the same in our community, and that's where we need to go. But we need to have that discussion as, thing. I just want you to think about it. Um, and I think there's a way we can do that, that it goes into a fund and it completely stricts just for that. And um, I think that's how we deal with the future uh, of our transportation and our roadways and our sidewalks, because we still have plenty of areas that don't have sidewalks. And we got areas that need replacement of sidewalks. And Lord knows we got plenty of potholes we need to keep filled. And we want to improve uh, as a community. Um, I think that was all the questions that, that we had that came in. Um, we do have uh, comment cards if somebody wants uh, uh, more questions. But sir, if you want to ask, I'm glad to answer. We're working on, we're not, we're not where we want to be, but it is getting better, and that is because we're working together as a, a staff. Well, the reason you have homelessness in a park is because there's nobody there. When, look, we failed at Finley Park. There's nothing else that we can say. We did not maintain it over the last decade like we should. We didn't prepare for the costs and everything. We're going into this totally different. You're actually going to have park rangers that are stationed there. So the old restaurant that there is getting renovated. So you have park rangers and maintenance crews there. You're going to have all these activities going on. So you're not going to have a population that are going to be staying there and sleeping because if you go, go to San Francisco, go to Portland, great examples, you go to their public parks, guess what's in those public parks? People, families, picnicking. Guess who's not there? The homeless because it's activated. We have to maintain it and we have to activate it. And so all our plans are around the activation. And now that we have more people living downtown and we're seeing that growth, that's how you're going to do it, by keeping it activated. Constantly keeping folks in there, working for beautification, working on outdoor exercise, having yoga in there, having plays, events. It is going to be our signature park again. You remember the glory days when we had the concert series and we had the movies and all of that? Look, we can be outside nine or ten months of the year, so we have a great opportunity. That's how we're going to deal with it. Thank you all for being here. I'll hang out and answer any questions. But thanks for taking the time.